before today's brew ships, I thought I'd have a couple of minutes of a very short and long chore. Because there's one question which always comes up whenever you start discussing theorists and strategists. That's usually, have they served? And that's an interesting question, because there are some eminent theorists and strategists who had served. Mahan served. Some would say with distinction, some would say not particularly distinctive as a naval officer, but a very good person about writing about naval history. Uh, Cable, he'd served in the army. Gorshkov, of course, was served. Sims served. Corbett hadn't. And he's not the only one who hasn't served. I see nothing wrong with that. Now, there is a reason why. I think if you see strategy and all these things as purely a military preserve, that's fine. That's a perfectly logical position to take. But that's also like saying wars are just fought between armies or navies. Wars are fought between countries. They are often led by civilian governments who are the strategists making decisions about where they're deploying the forces. Yes, the armies, navies, the generals and admirals will make recommendations. Their staffs will write up plans. But ultimately, it's the Churchills, the Roosevelts, the Chamberlains who make the decisions. Ultimately, it is the civilians. And ultimately, they will be informed as best they can. But unless you are a military coup, you're probably dealing with a civilian as your leader. In which case, perhaps, and I am very careful when I use this, the strategist, the theorist, especially a historian of the present, as Corbett would describe himself, the purpose of them is to not just, maybe not even educate, although they might well be involved in military education of military minds, but educate civilian minds in strategy, to build a bridge and a common language and linguistics between the civilians and the forces so they can understand each other, a common basis of reasoning. I often describe strategy and especially the work such as, well, we use this one, Mahan, Influence of Sea Power Upon History. It's often used as it emphasizes the battle fleet as a it's supposed to be a one way fits all, but it doesn't emphasize the battle fleet because Mahan believes that's over everything. It emphasizes the battle fleet arguably because that's the area he's most comfortable with because he is a naval officer. He, that's the bit he understands most. Whereas Corbett's quaintly titled Some Principles of Maritime Strategy. Well, he makes it some because he doesn't want to sound egotistical. But this is the maritime warfare. Hence, it's maritime strategy. Not some principles of naval strategy, some principles of maritime strategy. Because warfare, warfare at sea or at land is not just about the naval. It's about the whole maritime ecosystem. It's just about the whole scenario, including the civilians. And I think there becomes a problem when you start divorcing the two. If you try and treat political, international relations, civilian strategy as something separate from military strategy, then the civilian strategy doesn't understand the military strategy and the two won't work together. And the military strategy won't understand the civilian strategy and the two won't work together. You'll end up with a scenario like the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Imperial Japanese Army in World War II, or arguably the British Army and the Royal Navy in World War I where they have a strategy down the middle and what's worse is the civilian government because they believe they, they they're sort of not sure whether they should get involved in strategy because they feel as we're not professionals we shouldn't tell the military what to do don't make decisions they get caught up in plans when in fact of the actual fact strategy is something which is combined together strategy is everything 
strategy has to include the civilian and it has to include the military and it has to include both sides. And that's where you get people like Corbett. That's where you get the people, to an extent, I would say Cable. Because he's a naval strategist, a naval theorist. He writes about that. Yet his experience of service is the army and the diplomatic service. And that's the other problem once you go down the professional route. Well... Where do you, at what point where do you uh, cut it off? Should generals not comment, comment on naval strategy? Should admirals not comment on air power? Should air force officers not comment on land power? At what point do you cut it off? And you immediately cut out a lot of joined up thinking because modern warfare is incredibly joined up, but warfare has always been incredibly joined up. If we consider economic warfare, that at its heart is a civilian strategy. Because economic warfare, yes, it underpins and undermines the enemy's uh, war effort, but it undermines their economic civilian war effort. And that then, under, uh, then it's the second order effect which undermines their military and naval effort. Which means you need to talk to civilians because how many mili how many military personnel know what goes into a factory? What the key points are in a logistic supply train for I don't know a modern computer system are. If we want to look further at what the problems that come up when you divorce military and civilian thinking and try and claim that you should have the strategies as different and not treat it as one thing, we can look at the issues we've had with recent wars. Because arguably, the failure to understand the civilian dimension has been what has caused so much trouble. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. If we consider bilge pumps, when we're talking about Afghanistan, we made the point that we didn't build railways. And I remember listening to lots and lots of presentations and lots of people thinking at the time when they were talking about how to stabilize Afghanistan for the long term. There were all these very efficient, very eminent military personnel looking at it and going, well, what we have is an airfield. So what we need to do is we know air travel. What is high, We need to change their farming to high value goods and high value stuff that is economically viable to fly out. That is a great idea on paper. And long term, it might well have been a very sensible strategy. But most of the heavy goods in Afghanistan have to be imported by road, which is a very long and difficult windy route. So it's difficult to get supplies in, including fertilizer and all those things you need for those high value farming goods. And then you need to fly it out. It's a very sensible military strategy. But it's not a sense, it's a strategy if you're fighting a war and you want to supply your personnel, risk justifies the reward. But again, as we pointed out in bilge pumps, build a railway. You suddenly lower the cost of getting goods out of the country, which makes more of the existing agriculture, more of the existing industry viable as it gives them greater markets. But it also lowers the cost of bringing stuff in. It's a long-term investment. You're building dams. You're building huge other infrastructure projects. Why not build a railway? But no one said it in the meeting. And they, in the end, it didn't happen. And can we say with certainty that would have changed things? No, we can't.
No one can. And I'm sure there'll be people analysing Afghanistan for the next 150, 200 years and what happened there and what went wrong. But I don't think it's jumping the gun to say that we won the battles and we lost the war. And I would argue we won the battles because we have excellent military strategy, excellent fighting doctrine. But it's now divorced from the civilian strategy, from the civilian thinking. And we can blame the politicians for that. We can blame the civil servants for that. We can blame the military for that, if you really are so wish. But in reality, we've all done that. We've all allowed ourselves to get into this scenario where you are only allowed to talk about, only respected and only allowed to talk about the bits which are your specific area. And that's a problem. Because whilst you also don't want people who have no knowledge and no training and no understanding opponent on a subject, because there's basically no point, there's probably no point in listening to them, even if they do feel free to gas away. You do want a free and frank exchange of ideas between different fields, and you do want to push up some strategy. And some of those strategists are going to come from a civilian background. Some of them are going to be like Jim and Corbett, who I would argue is still worth reading, listening to, to this day, because when it comes to strategy, there are a few who are finer. I would argue Professor Andrew Lambert, my own professor, is a strategist. He would hate that phrase. He would hate to be described as such. But I would argue he is, and I would argue you should listen to him because of that. Because he thinks the thing's through. And yes, academia is probably a natural area where you'll find people who have the time and breadth to go and communicate and study and learn as much as they can so they can communicate in different levels. Because in the end, what strategy is, as I went back to the beginning, it's a framework, it's a communication, it's a linguistics that allows people to communicate ideas. And that's ultimate, um, the other problem we have. The difference between tactics, doctrine, and strategy. Too often, it's taken as if you're talking strategy, you are trying to tell an admiral where to position their ships and their fleet. You're not. That's tactics. That's doctrine. That's probably stuff which is pretty much best left to the uh, best left to the practitioners. Other than when you're talking about probably some of the really techy techy stuff, which you probably need engineers involved in as well, and scientists who come up with it so they can explain what the actual limitations of that equipment are, and make sure your doctrine fits the limitations and the practical limitations of that equipment. It's a synthesis. But strategy is where you put those fleets. Strategy is what you do with those fleets. Well, that's a whole different thing. So that is what this afternoon's brew ships is going to be about. This afternoon's brew ships is going to be about strategy. It's looking at the history of strategy and the debates that went on, because the debates often reveal a lot more about what's being thought and what's being done than necessarily the text do. But most of all, it's about communication. It's about not sitting in a silo and listening to people. You might disagree with them fundamentally, but instead of shouting abuse at them, you sit down and you write a reasoned response going through their arguing points, and hopefully they respond in the same way, and a dialogue's built up from which both parties will learn, and both parties will improve their thinking. Anyway, I hope you look forward to it, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Take care, and see you later.